Ephesians chapter 4, please. And we'll read verse 19. This passage has convicted me, actually. And this is one of my most convicting sermons, but it may not apply uh, to you because one thing I learned is whether the sermon is great or not great, the Lord always does opposites to teach me. So I've just learned to just give it to His hands. But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 19, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus and explaining about how lost people and even some Christians in general, if they're not very careful, if they yield to their fleshly nature, which where they used to live as lost sinners, constantly yielding to the flesh, this is what's going to happen to you. Verse 19, and it always convicted me. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Basically, Paul is warning about people who constantly yield to the wickedness of their flesh that they go now past feeling. They no longer feel the guilt and the shame and the conviction from their conscience. That's the reason why they're able to live lascivious lives. And lasciviousness is actually really filthy, really dark sins. Because the key answer is the last part of verse 19. To work all uncleanness with greediness. In other words, they constantly act, work out, and live anything unclean. But it doesn't stop right there. There's a famous saying that sin will take you farther along. You give sin an inch, it'll take you a mile. And that is very true because of the last word at verse 19, greed. Greed. Sometimes we feel like we can't have enough and we want more. And I realize that the sin of greed is pretty much universal to all of us in some way or in some form. And that is the acting out of your sin. The acting out of your weakness of your flesh. And if you constantly more, that's a tendency. And you practice it more. And it becomes a dreadful monster that people will not even realize who you are anymore. And that it becomes such a dark monster that other people start to dread you. You dread yourself and you wonder. And sometimes you would even question yourself, am I even really saved to begin with? And if you're a saved Christian, if you live your life delving into greed in a particular sin or weak area that you're in, you would even come to a point where you're afraid that you're saved, that you think that you're a lost sinner and you're not genuinely saved when you are truly saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But that's what sin does. It makes you doubt your salvation. And I hope that this sermon will speak to you and that the Lord will speak to you. The title of my message today is Monster Greed Has Crippled You. Let's pray. Fill within me Holy Spirit power, O oh, blessed Father, and the cleansing of your blood. I don't know how I literally survive and preach and breathe your words. I can't imagine how I can preach it, Lord, every single time that you've give me, given me the ability. And Father God, I'm not claiming inspiration right here. The Reading of your words and inspiration lies upon your words, and all I can do is just deliver it, Father. And I pray that you'll give me the ability and the strength and the guidance to preach conviction. And I pray that if this sermon applies to anybody in some way, that you'll convict them and change their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Are you crippled that you no longer feel anymore? That's the point. My first point is errors. Errors. And a lot of time you live your life in errors of your own ways and you don't go the correct path that God has called you to live accordingly. There are certain errors or sins that you delve into and once you taste it, it digs even deeper, right? And it becomes habitual and you keep doing it over and over again that you've lost conviction. And some of you have given up now and some of you think that there's no way that you can change your life. Some of you are still messing around with smoking or drinking or gambling there's worldly music that you still play once in a blue moon uh, you don't do it all the time but you do it once in a blue moon you just do it right before you walk inside the church parking 
change the channel when you come in, right? Worldly dressing, you dress all right at church, but back at home, you dress like the world and then you go out like the world. Some of you are still struggling with sexual imagery or drugs. And what happens is these dark sins, whatever drug or addiction or darkness that you're struggling with, it becomes something that you delve into and it becomes habitual. That's now a point of no return. James chapter 1 verse 15 says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. The Bible says that through lust it brings forth sin, and then sin it leads to death. And let me say, let's just say you can greedily grab as much as you want any sinful error. Delve into the world. Eat your heart out. Let your flesh be satisfied with all the fleshly, sinful appetites and errors that you can think of in life. Think of all kinds of sins. But you got to realize this. The more you grab, the more you're right. The more feeling you get into the flesh. The more feeling good. But you got to realize this. It's more of temporary temporary feeling. Another more temporary feeling. But each temporary sinful consequence of pleasure brings a permanent sinful consequence called death. And you got to realize that you feel like your happiness is delved into more and more sin as you can eat up. And you know it's temporary, but you eat it up anyway. Why? Because it fills in the void and it satisfies you. But you have no idea that you've also built up the permanent consequence of sin even larger. And the permanent state of your sin is much larger than your temporary pleasure in sin. So basically, you have to realize this. Do you honestly live, if I were to ask you a question and answer it honestly, do you want to live three quarters of your life with something that's deadly? Would you love to live the majority of your life with something that's deadly? That's my question to you. You know why? You live three quarters, the majority of your life with something deadly because you're living something temporary. And you get the more you add temporary errors and sins, the more you add the permanent. And the permanent will go much larger, more wide span, and even deeper than the temporary things. I'll tell you what permanent means. Permanent means as you keep drinking or smoking, you die early. That's permanent. It's much longer than every temporary thing that you can uh, put inside your body. Every temporary thing that you get into sin, the permanence adds up. The more sin that you add in your list as a rebellious, wicked person, then what happens is, guess what? The children that you have is going to be much more deep and widespread and permanent. They're going to be much more rebellious than you. You think that you're saved and you go to church here and there and you're okay with God. But you got to realize this. Guarantee one sin you commit has a consequence where it affects even deeper to, the gener to your next generation. Do you realize that? Do you realize that? Sometimes you have to check and ask yourself. Because kids, they look at the little slip-ups that their parents do. And they use that as their excuse to do their sins. And then guess what? They do much more than the parents. The permanent deadly consequences adds up much further than the temporary. Is that what you want to live your life into? Check up yourself. Are you a cripple? Did you cripple yourself that no longer the Holy Spirit convicts you anymore? Did you delve so greedily into that sinful error, whatever that is, that you no longer feel as much disgust as before? Wow. Ask yourself that question. No longer feel the disgust. It's now natural. It's now normal when you do it. There's not, it's not like you feel like throwing up when you do the sin. Did you delve so greedily into that sinful error that you no longer feel as much guilt as before? First time, fresh after a preaching, fresh after the Lord deals with you or gives you an experience that gets you right with God. There's a lot of guilt. But when you the same 
Yes. And guess what? The guilty feeling is crippled and you no longer feel the guilt anymore. The Lord's trying to show you mercy and have the Holy Spirit convict you through guilt. And he's working, but that guilt is crippled. And that guilt is so crippled that it's trying its best to convict you, but it can't. That's good, preacher. Yeah. You delve so greedily into the sin that you no longer feel as fearful as before. Wow. No longer, I mean, it's not like the Lord's going to send you lightning from heaven as soon as you commit the sinful act. It's not like that when you wake up in the morning and you drive to work, the Lord's not going to give you a car accident. It's not like that when you live out your life and you go to the sinful place and do the sinful action, the Lord's not going to give you a car wreck or let anything bad happen to your home or let a robber sneak up at you at nighttime or etc. You lost the fear of the Lord. Why? You crippled it. You cripple the fear of the Lord. And you're literally gambling your life every second. And you play with the mercy and grace of God. Here's a good one. Did you delve so greedily into that sinful error that you commit the sin more often than what you did before? The, short, the time spans in between your sinful actions has gotten shorter now. The times that you commit the number of sins have become adding one more throughout the day to two more and three more throughout the day. It's no longer where you get right with God after the sermon and then you fall back into sin within one week later. No, this time after you get convicted from the preaching, you sin the very next day. Why? Greed. Monster. Dreadful. Or the monster has crippled the conviction of the Holy Spirit within you. And some of you don't. My second point is electronics. Electronics. Television. Once you watch it, guess what? You don't stop. When it ends the show, then it goes, next time on the next episode. Da -da -dun, and then you go, Oh, I want to see what happens next. And then you binge watch. And then you just keep watching and watching. And then there are saved Christians, Bible-believing Christians, who think that Harry Potter is okay and uh, Game of Thrones is okay. There's nothing wrong and sinful about that. We live in a day and age like that, where it doesn't bother them anymore. It doesn't convict them on what they watch, what they see. They don't take caution anymore. They let their children watch garbage and they don't care about it. They don't take caution anymore. The internet, oh man, that, if that's the thing that's going to replace your TV, one YouTube clip to the next YouTube clip. And guess what? YouTube is built in that system. Facebook, Twitter is so much built into that system where it feeds your flesh, where you want to seek after a comment from somebody. From way, way worse now because teenagers need a shorter video and a shorter time span. And that's why you get Instagram and TikTok now. I'm so bad. Games. Once you play a game, guess what? The fingers don't stop. And you spend your fingers more on holding, pressing buttons rather than folding it in prayer. And then the games, it becomes the next level and you want to beat it and go to the next level. And then you get, I kid you not, going into my research with I don't if you see me play games and I'll go all over the board. But I points where there are games like Final Fantasy game where it's a big hit but they try to kill this one monster where you have to go 48 hours. It's, it's ridiculous. I'm like people are that dedicated to try to kill off a monster for 48 hours pressing a button rather than reading through several books of their Bible by now within 48 hours. Yeah, That's sad. They get more entertainment about Oh, I stabbed the monster again, rather than looking, gleaning something from the Word of God that contains hundreds of nuggets within 48 hours. Wow. They delve so much into games and online chatting, as I mentioned before, and then the iP uh, iPads, cell phones, etc. And guess what? We use spiritual excuses as well. We use spiritual excuses as well to justify that, well, you know, I'm watching and I'm commenting within a, a Christian social network. I'm watching a Christian video. But sometimes you have 
those things? Why are you commenting on those things? Because it makes you feel good? Because they're talking about a subject that appeals to your flesh? Or are you truly spending time? I'll tell you, here's a great example. All right, here's a great example. You know, I get into, uh, when I talk about revelation, or when I talk about time of the rapture, or deep doctrine, really fascinates me. Studying some of the conspiracy stuff like that. A lot of interesting stuff. Uh, mythology as well but see those are things that appeal to my flesh and sometimes you have to ask yourself you love chaos something dark rather than the the spirit rather than how to win a soul rather than how to practice a clean mind keep clicking the videos and keep doing the chatting and then dip, trying to make your own YouTube channel that's why a lot of charismatic preachers, they have huge YouTube channels when they focus on uh, just one type of flesh. Right. And that's something cataclysmic. That's something that's end times. That's something that's like a rapture. It's a, and I know that stuff because if you look at my videos, I thank God that I get a lot of views, but it's sad that they were, there would be more views on something that's mythological, something that's uh, eschatology rather than prayer right. watch the videos on prayer I think that's the most life-changing thing ever and there are people commenting saying I wish that they would click more on this one rather than all the other stuff Pastor Kim talks about but you know what that's how people are that's flesh first Peter 1 13 says wherefore gird up the loins of your mind be sober see God wants you to Take a hold of your mind and then be sober. Think seriously. If you greedily grab as many electronics that you want, and let's say you do that. Eat your heart out. Be greedy. Spend as much time that you want on a video game. On the internet. With your that you want. But the more you grab those things, the more you corrupt your mind physically and spiritually. You might say, really? Yes, even if it's something spiritual used as, as an excuse for an electronic means, it's done for the convenience of the flesh. I mean, we got people now not reading the Bible by taking out the Bible and writing notes, but preferring to have some kind of iPad set up system where people don't come to church to hear the preacher, but rather they just want to look through a virtual screen. Even spiritual means, there are excuses. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad that we can use the electronics to beat Satan at his own game right. and minister to so many people out there. But you got to realize this. The reason why man even gave birth to something that's electronic to begin with, it's because it's convenient. It appeals to the flesh. Some may argue that, well, it helps with quick concentration levels, so I don't understand why you say that it corrupts my mind physically. I don't get that. Sure, it does, but there are also studies. You've got to realize that studies do prove it helps with quick concentration levels, but it proves it does not help long-term concentration levels. doesn't help long-term. You know why? Because your attention and your interest is in one movement of a screen, and you want the next one. That's why YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and there's going to be new companies that come out are going to make it shorter and shorter and shorter and faster and faster and faster because that appeals your flesh. And that's the reason why you, you all can't have a brain or a mindset that's disciplined in constantly studying God, in doing, concentrating and doing well in school or in your or socializing with people. You can't do that. You have to have something that gives to your mind that you dictate and want rather than sacrificing yourself and, and realizing what I can do to communicate or do well with the environment surrounding me. No, you want the environment meet up to you rather than you meet up to the environment. That's why there are some preachers that say, oh, I'm a preacher. Word of God and YouTube. No, you just are lazy and you can't sacrifice for people because you know that once you start a ministry from scratch, especially in a Bay Area, you flop and flip. 
And that's why they make all the excuses in the world, you know, trying to draw a whiteboard or then trying to go out in the middle of the woods and show off their knowledge from a bookshelf and then say, I'm so spiritual. And then they try to uh, attack honest, sincere Christians who work from scratch in working in the gates of hell that itself in ministering to people in their environment. And they criticize them by saying, oh, church buildings are pagan and pastors are part of a Catholic system. And 501c3, they're just compromising with the government. They're just lazy. That's their problem. That's just, uh, that's just cold when you do that to honest, sincere, hardworking yeah. pastors. Yeah. Especially pastors who've been working for 30-something plus years. And then, with, and then you criticize those people. God called you to be away from YouTube. Good. We don't want you anymore. Did you delve so greedily into electronics? Think about it. Ask yourself, did you delve so much into it that you felt fatigued lately? You've been lacking energy lately? You can make excuses for your health, but you got to realize this. Yeah, it's your health, but what contributes it is this guy. Has the devil been attacking your mind successfully? Have you been getting weird thoughts, weird dreams, and stuff like that? You know why? Because of electronics. And it puts things into your head. And the devil, he uses that to get you. And you have so, such a vivid imagination. Has your mind been occupied on worldly things because of the electronics you played? Or has it truly made you ponder on spiritual things? Hmm? Think about it. Can you honestly say your mind has really been on spiritual things? Or has it been slipping up with some of the worlds here and there? Why? Because you spend too much time in your world wow. that appeases your flesh. And then you imagine and envision that, daydream about it. Has your mind been attentive to electronics for hours long, but the Bible reading, prayer, coming to church and studying the Bible, and whatever service has been opened up, even through Zoom, we did it electronically to appease you guys, but even through that, you've cut off more time on that one, those things, because you spend hours long in this, that it leads to this, and then like this, and then like this, and then you become in such a bad mess that you end up like Brother Tom with a bad back. <laughs> so that's what happens is, you know, the, this is actually serious. It is life. Yes, this yes, is life. Yes. And guess what? I'm even telling you something that even liberals agree with. I'm telling you that pretty much every religion or a lost or saved person will agree with. Electronics, that's something that's detrimental to your physical health, but not just that, your spiritual health. Right. You can't function with the real world around you, people around you. Let's go preach it. Yeah. Why? Because you delve so much into this. But trust me, I guarantee you this. If you don't believe me, cut that off and spend more time with church people. And you're going to see a huge change yeah. within three months. I guarantee you. Yes. My third point is a state. A state. A lot of people, they spend time in their own riches, what they love. And a lot of people, they try to save up money. They try to get into better jobs, better positions. And they want to keep their wealth, whatever they have. But sometimes you have to look at yourself. When the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 3 through 4, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Yeah. Now, you know, Everyone works their tails off to get a better house living condition in the Bay Area, or an apartment for that matter, because it's so horrible here. People spend their lives in work or in school so that they can get more money. Some people save up money or save up money for a big vacation trip that's something nice and attainable. Or they gamble and they go to casinos so that they can get more money. They want to develop more riches. I want a larger room. I want more rooms. I want bigger property. I want more cars. The car we have is not nice enough. We need a nicer one. I want better clothes. I want some enough where I can take care of even my own children and my own family. But even if you greedily grab as many riches as you want for your estate, 
The more you grab, guess what? The more trash you get. Did you understand what I just said? I think you don't understand that. You literally think that this is not trash, your riches. What do I mean by trash? Trash, it's a waste. It's a wasted item. It's a wasted item. Do you know why? Because if you don't think so right now, it has value, it has worth right now, but guess what? As if the rapture were to happen now, in the middle of my preaching, what good was all your hard work and the money you saved up and the plans that you made to develop your riches, better place, better living condition? What are you going to do? Cry to God in heaven? Oh, uh, go, uh, let me get back the riches and enjoy it a little more? No, it's a waste. It's a waste. You don't realize the job, the school that you're studying, the money that you saved up, the plans that you had to develop riches, your home, and how you make it all nice, and etc. And some of you are saving up your retirement plans, and etc. All those riches, trash, waste of time. Especially if you're a business owner and then the coronavirus happened combined with the riots. So much for your riches. They're going to be gone. That time you wasted, you dedicated so many long hours for your riches. Guess what? Nothing. Yeah. Waste of time. You're wasting time. You are wasting time. You would literally, I mean, I'll tell you what, man. I mean, compared to that one, if you were to waste time by just sitting down and opening up the Bible and that's it, you would, you would save way more time than that. Amen. Did you delve so greedily into your rich estates that you've been more fearful lately of how your money has been popping? Or have you found peace in God? That's good. I'll tell you what, me, in my case, and those of you who knew me from the beginning, I struggled, especially in the Bay Area. And I didn't have money. And the only thing that literally kept me surviving was by God's grace through prayer, somebody would just get, give me money like that. And this was even before I was popular online. Our church, we, had, we were struggling. But it took only one person who didn't attend our church as much. But the Lord laid it upon his heart to give $10,000. And that made our church survive for about a year and a half. Amen. Did I fear? Did I get afraid? No, I trusted in the Lord. Right, right. I have so much peace. That whenever my, uh, so I always keep track of money, don't get me wrong, I do that, but the Lord always provides. Yes, He does. He always provides. I have so much peace. You know why? I don't delve greedily into my riches That's and good. say, I want to spend it on this, I want to spend it on that. No, I say, look, the Lord will get me to enjoy what He wants me to enjoy. Yeah, amen, amen. I have so much peace, but you don't. Your money's dropping, and you get fearful a little bit more. Greed. Did you greedily grab as many riches that you want for your estate that you depend more on money lately rather than God to take care of you? You have to ask yourself that. You've been spending more time working long hours in work to get more money rather than praying on your knees for God to give you money and trusting in Him. Are your affections truly set on heaven much more than this world? Really answer that question honestly. Can you honestly say that? You know why not? You're digging to the riches. You're really more attentive to the riches in this world. Here's the last question. Here's a good one. Did you delve so greedily into your rich estates that you, without hesitation, increased your level of giving or tithes? Or did you debate on how much to give? A person who wasn't, who's not really concerned about his financial level doesn't hesitate to give to the Lord. But when they hesitate, there's something in there like, I don't want this rich part to diminish in some way because I need it. Wait, you need it? Really? You need it more than God? I could care less about your money, but I care more about your benefit. That's why I'm preaching this to you. Right. To really expose and see if you are prioritizing your riches or to the Lord. But guess what? The, the conviction is crippled now. Conviction is crippled about tithing. Cri crippled about your love for heaven. Crippled about faith in the Lord. You, you forgot what it's like. You know why? Crippled. Conviction crippled. 
It's a monster. My fourth point is esteem. Esteem. A lot of people, they like to have esteem amongst people. They want to look good. They want to please their family. I want to please my parents. I want to please my loved ones around me. I want to please my wife. I want to please my husband. I want to be a good parent to my kids. So uh, they're spending a lot of concentration on their family. Especially in, if you're in uh, different cultures, they prioritize a huge thing about family. Popularity among friends. A lot of people, they want to look popular in their workplace. Popular with their peers in school. And they just want to impress them. There are people, if you're single, you want to tr attract the opposite sex. And that's why they spend a lot of time about how they appear, how they act, and how they dress. And even saved Christians want to be popular amongst fellow saved Christians. Preachers want to put on a good impression for other preachers. Why? Esteem. Yeah. They want the esteem. They like that Jack Hiles clap that goes five minutes long as soon as you walk up. I'm not lying to you. They literally do that long. They literally do that long. I'm like, good night. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Celebrities. That's why. Why do you think people want to be a celebrity? Esteem. Yeah. They want fame. They want popularity. Why do some Christians felt called by God to start a YouTube channel and justify themselves of what they do on YouTube? They they just like the esteem, the views, right. the subscribers, etc and people to talk about them and know about them. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34 it says, There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. See, that's the point of this verse, which is very eye-opening. If you get married, what happens is, the rule of thumb, you have to, spend more time in pleasing your spouse than the Lord. And then it becomes a juggle and a priority and a balance and a light full of struggle on how, how much I'm supposed to please the Lord, but at the same time I don't want to uh, displease my spouse. It becomes very difficult. And that became eye-opening to me is that imagine if you had two spouses and, or three. Imagine you had four or five. Now do you realize how much of a stress level you'll get in trying to please every one of them. And that's what you got to understand. The more greedily you try to grab for esteem, I want the subscribers go up and the views go up, the more you are in bondage to pleasing oh, people. Wow. That's good. And the more you're going to compromise. And the more you're going to water down. That's good. You don't have a chance to be free. And you're always going to stress out between pleasing God and pleasing people. How do, I, how do I appear in my workplace? How do I appear in my school? How do I appear with fellow pastors surrounding me? Now, I'm not telling you to be a jerk, obviously. You have to be a good testimony. But for crying out loud, are you truly setting your priority in pleasing the Lord more than people? Because you're a slave. You're a robot. And that's a sad life you're living in. Check yourself. Did you delve so greedily to gain esteem from people that you've offended God? more than you've offended people? That's good, brother. Did you delve so greedily to gain, to gain esteem from people that you have to ask yourself, how often have you thought of pleasing God rather than people? That's good. If, especially if you're a big pastor with a big church. Did you think about what would so-and-so think of this? What would so-and-so think of that? Or more of God? What's right? Do you become overly concerned when a person pushes you away? Or are you at peace in God? Sometimes you feel like, oh, the person's misunderstanding me, or I'm just too, the person will think I'm mean, and I'm not kind enough, and et cetera, et cetera. Hey, you got to watch out for that. See, it's a matter of what, doing what's right in God's eyes rather than pleasing people. See, you want esteem. You want people to love you. Think you're kind. Think you're hospitable. Think you're so nice. But guess what? If you're going to be honest, you and I are just filth and dirt. Yes. And if people think of you that way, then at least they don't know the full truth about you. If they knew the full truth about you, then you are 
the person that deserves hell. Do you, don't you feel more concerned with God pushing you away while you're drawing more towards people? Do you honestly feel more concerned? You know what's that? You know what that reaction is? Crippled. Crippled. Monster greed. Crippled the conviction within you. My fifth point is end. End. A lot of people are so greedily thinking about their end and what they want to do, their goal, their ambition in life. A lot of you have talents, certain talents, and then you pursue that talent in a way where I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to be, and some of these people are like, I'm going to be an actor or an actress someday, or I'm going to be, you know, God called me to preach when I was six, and I'm going to be a great preacher one day and have so many meetings. People think about their work and thinking about their end. You know, I'm going to get this promotion, I'm going to get this position, I'm going to get three times more the amount of money, and I'm going to do this. They have an end toward their school. I'm going to get the diploma. I'm going to get the approval from the professors. And I can go for a more advanced degree. Spiritual ambitions. We're going to get a large church. We're going to get more people. But that can even be outside of God's will. And then you compromise so much that you water down in a way that ends up like uh -huh. a Paul Chapel church. Amen. Why? Because you're thinking so much about, I, I have a spiritual ambition or an end. But then the preaching waters down. And you don't preach the same like you do to amongst sheep compared to your secret revival meetings among oh. pastors. Your preaching style changed. What happened? Oh. Are you afraid of what the other people might do and leave? Wow, that's good. Yeah. I know, I know pastors. Look, when I call out pastors, I'm not being mean. I know. You know why? I've been in the ministry for more than 10 years and nearly 99% of my life is around independent fundamental Baptist churches. I know all these big names and, and I enjoy their sermons. But I know their pastoring and why they preach that way. Some of you are just content with your regular everyday living, right? Your end is the way that I'm living, my comfort zone, I don't want anything to interfere or ruin that. And you want to maintain it, right? Some of you have other plans or other ends. But what good is all that when 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. I mean, that's the point. The point is, is that all that you're striving for your end goal, you're not going to get your kingly crown and rulership at the end if you don't strive for that one. That's the point. Let's say you can greedily grab as many end goals and desires that you want and that you planned out. The more that you grab, guess what? The more you're losing time with end goal in heaven. Hey, what about your Bible reading, your prayer, going to church, getting people saved, getting people involved in church? That's where the time should be spending, not toward the school, not toward the job, not toward your end goal and desire because all that time, you're wasting on those things. And then the kingly reward in heaven is eternal. Not just 20 years of your life. That's so sad. People saving up their retirement, why? For the next 20 years of their life. That's small. That's sad. That's your end goal? What about eternity, huh? Ruling cities. Cities. And not just your own little home in your life. I mean cities and terrain around you for a thousand years. That's what you get in the millennium. Beats in getting becoming a millionaire or the mayor of a city. We're talking about a king here, a kingly life. When you reign with God in heaven, you're going to realize how much better it was compared to your worldly ambition if you don't believe it now. And you're going to regret it. You're going to regret when you go to heaven. You're going to go, man, how can I spend all my time with my end goal here when I wasn't? What you're doing, you're wasting time. You're wasting time. Precious time. Check up. Italy to gain. That haven't even planned out a goal of becoming the best for the Lord. When's the last time you've done that? When was the last time you completely surrendered? To whatever God called you to do. 
When's the last time you've done that? Shows that's not your end goal, right? Do you become upset? This is a good one. Do you become upset when there are constant interruptions to your plan without thinking it's from God? Why? Because you have an end goal and it interfered, right? And no one likes that. Do you justify your ambition so strongly without even considering it's God opposing it and telling you no? And you're justifying your ambition. No, it is God's will. It's something I want to do, and etc. You know what that is? Conviction got crippled. And the Holy Spirit's not convicting you. This is my will. And you go, no, it's, it's not God's will. And then you go, oh. And then you, you deteriorate more and more and more until you're at a point where you no longer believe God's will anymore. And you believe your will is the right thing. Wow. And you're fully persuaded. My last point is everything. Everything. Did you delve so greedily into basically everything and anything where your past feeling from the spirit? It could be where it's referring to oversleeping. It could be skipping spiritual duties, skipping Bible reading, skipping prayer, skipping church attendance, skipping soul winning. Out of laziness. It could be because of food that you greedily delved into or drinks. The vehicles that you like, the sports and the games that you love, other hobbies that you love, or any possession that seems valuable to you. Or it could be anything about, here's the ultimate one, everything about yourself, who you are, your personality, your attitude and character. This is how I am, so I'm just going to keep it that way. What if it conflicts God's will? What if it hurts other people around you? What if it hurts God's church? What if it's not ministering to lost souls effectively? You know, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4 through 7, we're not going to turn there for time's sake, but the children said, we want a king like all the other nations. And Samuel was grieved and kept warning them, but they didn't care. So when Samuel prayed to the Lord, God did not say, I'm going to send lightning from heaven and get them right with God. No, God did not say, convict them with this preaching and then there's going to be a revival. No, God said, give them one more warning, but they're not going to listen. Give them what they want. Yeah. Um, you better be careful. You know, what, you know what the cripple thing is? When you keep having that cripple feeling and you don't feel conviction from God, God is letting you have yeah. what you want. You want no guilt over your sin, no guilt over doing the things that you want to do. God will give you what you want. Have at it! What? And that's a dreadful monster. Yes, a cripple. Cripple the Holy Spirit, craved him so much that you hardly feel him anymore. Yeah. And that's why some of you are wondering, am I even saved to begin with? Mm. Why don't I feel guilty anymore? Mm. Why don't I have a desire for Bible reading, church, or preaching? What happened to that? And you know what happened? Cripple! It's a monster! That got rid of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you can't feel God anymore. Imagine the Holy Spirit, the Holy of Holies, God Almighty, living inside you. And you can't even sense His presence. Wow. wow. What are you willing to do for $10 million if it was given to you? What are you willing to do for $10 million? I mean, seriously. Are you willing to do anything for that much? Two-thirds of Americans polled agreed to at least one or some of the several following. And you wouldn't believe what people would do for $10 million. Two-thirds of, Amer of Americans. They would abandon their entire family, 25%. They would abandon their church, 25%. Would become prostitutes for a week or more, 23% would give up their American citizenships, 16%. Would leave their spouse, 16%. Would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free, 10%. Would kill a stranger, 7%. Would put their children up for adoption, 
Unheard of. Why? $10 million. $10 million. And some of you would probably say, I'm not bad like these people, but you already are. For your greedy desire, that's not even $10 million. You don't even have $10 million. You sacrifice your church. You sacrifice your eternal reward. Wow. And what's worse than murdering a person is that you murder a soul by not leading that person to Christ. Well, I'm not good at soul winning. Just come to church. Just come to a soul winning event. Just read your Bible pray. Trust me, the conviction will naturally come. But you don't care. You could care less. Let souls die and burn in hell. You know why? For your greed, that's not even worth $10 million. You don't feel God after this preaching? You don't feel your heart beating? Can't you just even look deep and see that there's a little bit beating in your heart? And that's the Lord knocking and saying, do you hear me? He's not saying, do you hear me, bang, but he's just going like this because he knows that you crippled the voice. He's saying, can you hear me? I'm talking to you. I still love you, child. I still can use you. If you do, get right with God now. Chase after Jesus Christ. Open the door and say, God, I want you to come in. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. Oh, can't you sense the Holy Spirit convicting your heart and beating you? Or have you crippled the conviction and crippled the conviction? Some of you, if you're not saved, then perhaps the Holy Spirit is convicting you today. The flesh has crippled the conviction within you. And you don't think about your eternity. Today would be a great time to get saved before it's too late. Don't let the conviction leave you. If you are to die today, please answer honestly. Are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? 100% sure you go to heaven after you die? You might say, Pastor, I'm not sure. Today can be that day. Three easy steps it takes. Step one, sin puts you to hell, so you can't go to heaven. I'm sure you realize you've sinned, so you've got to understand you can't go to heaven because of your sin. You might say, well, then what can get rid of my sin? Nothing. Nothing can wash away your sin except the blood of Jesus. And that's step number two. That's why Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so his blood can wash away the sin. So many people, you even know that story a billion times, but you don't really understand the meaning. He died, buried, resurrected, because that's literally the only thing that you've got to 100% rely on to get rid of every sin you've done. Wash away your sin. It's his blood, that very act. You might say, I do, preacher, I do. Then step number three, you just need to say that to him. Just say to him, God, I'm 100% relying what you did on the cross. It's so sad people think that, well, if I'm a good Christian, if I clean up all my sin, follow the commandments, and love Jesus, and there's some fruit in my life, then I'm a saved person. Then you're relying on the wrong thing. You're relying on what you do. You're not 100% relying only on the act of what Jesus did on the cross to save you. If you want to do it right now, we can give you that opportunity. Uh, I'll give you the words on how to say it to God. You can repeat after me. But uh, you don't have to feel ashamed or embarrassed. You can say it to yourself. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it this way. You can say, Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died buried and resurrected, so his blood can wash away my sin. I only trust in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. If you would bow your head and close your eyes just one last time, please, one last time. This is out of respect for the person sitting next to you. 
No one knows who you are, and every head is bowed, and every eye is shut. And I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to call you out. If you just repeated those words after me, and this is your first time that you've done it with me, this is your first time you've done it with me in this church, could you slip up your hand real briefly, real quick, and say, Pastor, I just repeated those words after you, and I just got saved. Would you slip up your hand real briefly, real quick? Okay, I'll take it for granted. Thank you so much for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, we lost our conviction, Heavenly Father. I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to beat and knock and that we'll remember the fear of the Lord. We'll remember our love for you. We'll remember the guilt over and the disdain of sin and the desire and the passion of the Holy Spirit. I pray that our greed will not cripple us. And if there's anyone that has been greedy to a point of giving up, I pray that you will revive them again, Heavenly Father. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.